Well, I appreciate you guys tuning in and watching again and listening again. I don't know if you know me, but my name is Jamison Sharp, and I'm sitting here with... Pedro Sauer. All right, and you're listening and watching the Jiu-Jitsu Takedown Podcast. And we are here at Gracie Umaita in Kansas City. Not only my home academy, but uh, Professor Sauer here is not only like a legend and top-level Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu professor and master in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, but he got his start at Gracie Umaita down there in Brazil. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Professor? Tell us a little bit about, about your background. Okay. Well, actually, I got started in downtown Rio de Janeiro, uh -huh. uh, the first academy that was in uh, Avenida Rio Branco, 151 um, 151-18 storage high. That's where I started. And um, after a few years there, we moved to another location. Uh, there was uh, Vasco da Gama. And uh, we had a little period of time before Vasco da Gama to Clube de, de, Clube de Flamengo, Clube de Remo da Lagoa. Yeah. And after that, we moved for good at the Grace Maita. Right, right. And uh, you, you, you got your start in Jiu Jitsu when, uh, when I guess you were teamed up with Hickson as one of his friends when you was a child? Uh, well, we used to hang out on the streets. We, I used to be neighbors. Uh, you know, Elio and my, my parents, uh, we used to live in the same neighborhood. Oh, is that right? So when I was a kid, I, I met Hickson in the streets, and uh, we just hang out on the street. I never knew nothing about Jiu-Jitsu. Hickson was a very simple guy, a very normal guy, just one of us, and just one of the buddies. And uh, we just, uh, you know, like kids, we just used to do teenage stuff when I was little kids, and I, I was not very interested about the Jiu-Jitsu in the beginning. And I didn't know nothing about jiu-jitsu, i never seen it. I'd done a judo before, I'd done uh, capoeira, I'd done some boxing and taekwondo. That was kind of what I did in martial arts. That's really neat. That's really interesting. Now, when you got your start in jiu-jitsu, you said you wasn't really interested in it. What was that deciding factor that made you change your thinking and say, hey, hold up here. This is, this is something here. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, when I went to the first time to the De Grace Academy, and Elio was, Grandmaster Elio, it was not there. It was, uh, Hickson was there. Hickson was a young kid. And it was, uh, it was some older people there. Uh, not Elio, he was not present, but I remember Horion being around. Right. Uh, Helson was around. And um, what happened that time, the first time that I went to the Grace Academy and I saw uh, a training between Hickson, that's at the time it was a green belt. So we just little kids, 15 years old. Sure. And uh, I saw Hickson train against a purple belt. That's the only thing that I remember. I don't remember who the guy was. And uh, when I saw the train, I was in shock. Yeah. I couldn't believe. I couldn't understand one thing that was going on. Yeah. I thought that those two guys were just kind of trying to kill each other yeah. in a, a kind of very vigorous kind of playground. I didn't understand that thing that's going on. And I was like, no way. I'm never going to do that. This is yeah. crazy. <laughs> And I pretty much stayed almost a couple of years without coming back to the mat. Yeah. And we, I knew Hickson from the street. He always talked to me, Pedro, can I come? I said, no, you guys like to grab men too much, man. <laughs> I used to kind of play a little bit. I like to grab girls. Yeah, that yeah. That was my excuse. Hickson just laughed, just smiled, you know. But uh, anyway, when, time, when, when the time came that I visit again the Grace Academy, Hickson asked me for a ride. So I drove him over there, and it was a parking spot right in the front of the academy. And I had to take the spot. Sure. So I parked the car there and I told Hickson, I'm not going to do nothing. Well, when I go up there, <laughs> I saw Grandmaster Elio. Right, right. And Elio was sitting there in the front desk, shook my hand on. I felt the sh you know, big, strength. The strength of vigorous hands, big hand, <clears throat> very kind of direct, very straightforward guy. And uh, he's like, oh, this is the guy you're telling me that he was a boxer? And I was like, oh, not, you know, I'm not going to do anything. No, 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 you come here to visit, you got to do it. Oh, no. So Elio pretty much dragged me. <laughs> yeah. Put me a 16-ounce glove and lined up some guys towards me. Hoyler was one of them. Hoyler, oh, yeah. And uh, uh, I, I, the outcome, I understood very quickly how unfair jiu-jitsu was. Sure. And especially uh, when you talk about any kind of physical alteration, uh, altercation, fights on the streets. Right. Um, because Jujitsu has a very smart ability, very smart, peculiar ability to bring the opponent to your environment. It's like this, a Jujitsu practitioner wants to grab the guy, wants to close distance. So you want to be very close to the guy. But for do this, instead of walk forward, you walk backwards. Yeah, you draw you, him in. You draw the guy in. So what happened when the guy come moving forward, and now you decide to move forward, we have the, the, the two bodies colliding. And that brings the odds too much for Jujitsu. You know, this is a little trick that, because Jiu-Jitsu practitioner, he'll be happy 
if he's not uh, if he's not throwing a punch. Right. And he would be very, even more happy to not receive a punch, of sure. course. But the idea is because you 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 pretty happy to not be after not to go after punch, you create this distance. You create this illusion distance between you and your opponent. You keep your legs if you have to as a distraction. But what it does, you you make one guy moving back. This guy is going to try to punch. Right. When you walk him to punch, you collide towards him. And that's the most unfair detail that, in my personal opinion, uh, that can happen in Jiu-Jitsu because we can bring people to our territory mm -hmm. very friendly, minimal risk, and now you are in an environment. It's incredible stuff. It, it's, a, it's a deception exactly. that you cannot see. But us, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu prepares you to see around the corners and see the possibilities. And it's extremely effective. Exactly. Yeah, so fast forward, you started training with the, uh, the Gracie family, and, and mm -hmm. you come to the United States. And once you get here to the United States, everybody out there has seen your video of going against, what is his name, Lance Burton? Bachelor. 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 He was Mr. Utah, he's 250 pounds, bodybuilder. And here, Master Professor uh, uh, Pedro Sauer here, uh, can you tell us a story about that? That's really interesting because yeah. people, uh, people out there, you know, they see that. Yep. You know? Well, the story, the real story about this, that Hoist just got done fighting UFC 1. Okay. And uh, when I was there in Salt Lake City, Utah, I got called to go to a radio station. It was a K-Bear 101. Okay. And uh, I didn't spoke as much English at the time. You no, know, it was, I had three years of America, mm -hmm. give take so. I spoke some, but uh, not as much to having kind of the, the deep conversation. And uh, when I was there at the radio station, uh, they saw me walking there, and somebody made a comment that I was too skinny, mm. I was too small. Mm. And I was not there to hear the comment. Right. But what happened is, uh, the, the announcers, the radio guys, they kind of look at the Lance, like, you know, thought that, like, hey, Lance, I bet you can take him. Uh -oh. And, oh, yeah, I think I can take him. And they started, <laughs> you know, they started this conversation here. And one thing that not so many people knows, and I didn't know that either, that Lance, he did some wrestling before. Okay. So he was not just a bodybuilder flesh. Sure. He was a bodybuilder with wrestling kind of experience. Um, because in Utah, uh, every little kid, everybody in Utah wrestles. Okay. Utah, uh, the, the, the prophet of the uh, Mormon Joseph church. Joseph Smith, yeah. Joseph Smith, it right. was a wrestler. Oh, is that right? So <laughs> tell knows? me which family from Utah doesn't want to wrestle? <laughs> So that's what happened. Utah was a very, that's what Mark Schultz ended up to be in Utah, right? I see that, okay. Mark Schultz was the wrestling coach right. for BYU, one of the most accomplished wrestlers on the planet. Dave Schultz, it was on his way to Utah when, you know, the guy DuPont decided to, in a jealous rampage, crazy kind of me mechanic, you know, decided to take his life away. So mm. he was moving to Utah at the time, and Utah was a mecca. It was a good wrestlers over there, very good people. Well, they sent us some, it was the Sanderson brothers that was there too, I believe. Uh, I forgot the name now, but the, my, one of my students, Rick Landell, who is an incredible guy, incredible artist, incredible practitioner, one of the monsters, the biggest monsters in Jiu Jitsu, one of the hidden treasures of Jiu Jitsu is this kid, little Ricky, that teach uh, uh, Jiu Jitsu uh, everywhere he goes. And he's in, in wrestling, he's doing like a, this 1% uh, things that he does that you progress every day, 1%. Uh, incredible kid, super yeah. smart, super bright, and he was teaching the, the Sanderson's family. That was another... The Sanderson's? Yeah, right. they're, and they're from Heber, Utah. Okay. And on the early days, the dad came to one of those matches. Oh, the Gracie Challenge the matches? Gracie Challenge. Okay, now we're getting yep. to it, yeah. Yep. So that's how it used to be Utah. Utah was a pretty tough environment, pretty hardcore. So when you got the telephone call for the challenge, what was going through your mind? Uh, well, actually, it was not the day in the office, you know. Uh, yeah. At the time, it was, uh, we was not, it was not just one telephone because I used to have guys every day. Sure. We had guys every day come to the school, and they did the challenge matches. We brought the gloves. We, you know, we had an offer. Horium put an offer of $100,000 in 1991. It was $100,000 in the Black Belt magazine offering that kind of money for whoever could beat a jiu-jitsu black belt. Sure. And I was in Utah, black belt, 150 pounds. There you go. So everybody came to the <laughs> But the catch was, yeah, if you want to make $150,000, uh, $100, you got to put $10,000 down. If you lose, ah, you lose $10,000. You got to put some That was a catch. Yeah. But if you're already here, let's not waste our time, all right? You already make this trip. You're yeah. already here. So let's go ahead and do the challenge. 
But uh, what we do now, let me put some bo boxing gloves on you. You can do whatever you, you thought you could, could do. You can do anything you want. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to put you down the ground and make you say uncle. <laughs> You're going to make an example of him about how effective Gracie Jiu Jitsu is. That's because at the time, nobody knew about it. Nope, nobody knew about it. It was pretty deceiving when you, when you saw Hoist fighting, when you saw me and Mr. Utah fighting. Uh -huh. You look at that thing like, what the hell is going on over there? Yeah. Why you stop the fight? What's yeah. going on? Well, nobody understood Jiu Jitsu. I think today we get to say thank you very much to Joe Rogan. Right. You know, that is over there in UFC, is a brilliant guy, yes, smart mind, you understand about mechanics, understand Jiu Jitsu perfectly, yeah. and he can educate the people there. He knows his top level Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Oh, he's, a, very, yeah, he's, he's very, very good. He's very good. Yeah, yeah. he's a good protection. He trained with Eddie Bravo, that's another incredible protection. Mm -hmm. You know, not a, you know, the guy is like a talent. I agree. You know, and strong and flexible. So it, it, that, that kind of quality breeds to, to other people. So Joe, Joe Rogan is somebody that we, we all got to say uh, very thankful to him because he's educating the population. He really is. And you know, the, uh, the re he goes into the minute details yep. about the techniques, uh, in, not only in UFC, but on his podcast. And you know, people, it's, he's making it clear and easy for people to follow along yep. and be educated. It's great stuff. I love it myself. Yep. You know, you know uh, Professor Sauer, you know, speaking of, I was going to get to, uh, you come, you, did you start out in California with Horion? Is no, that? I started Jiu Jitsu in Brazil. Right, well I know that, right. but when you came to the United States. Yes, I moved to California. You moved to California, you was out there at uh, Torrance with the Academy of the Actually, Actually, before the Academy was, was uh, the Academy was inaugurated in July of 1990. I moved here in May of 1990. So in May of 1990, I was teaching, I was sleeping in the garage. Okay. I slept in the garage with myself, it was me, Grandmaster Elio, and Limon, we slept in Hickson's garage. Amazing. You yeah. know, those are things we don't really hear about. Yeah. And you know, it, it's fantastic to hear about the stories like that because a lot of people forget that this started from a garage. Yep. Yeah. And, and you the, know, it grew. And we all used to be starving. Yeah. We are completely broke at the yeah. time. We try to get fights with anybody, anybody. Yeah. We try to fight the mailman. <laughs> the guy who delivered the mail. Hey, come on, come, come here, on, let's try it out. You kind of look fit, come on. We try <laughs> to do anything because we, a uh, bunch of Brazilian guys, very incredible amount of talent people, but we all, everybody was broke. Sure. And we drove around every karate school, every taekwondo school, every other martial arts school, packed. And we're like, no, come on, man, how come all those people doing karate, kung fu, uh, taekwondo and we have the jiu-jitsu here but nobody knows nobody cares nobody understand that that's how the challenge started happening then the challenge started happening people started taking notice because everybody was getting whooped and you know what you guys put the great jiu-jitsu on the map yep. and made made it the premier and most effective not only deadly but effective martial art known to man yep yep i appreciate it I really appreciate it because the history needs to be preserved. Yep. And I think a book needs to be written about it. That's true. And let, let me ask you, you started your own journey in jiu-jitsu as far as uh, your own business journey. And tell us a little bit about that, where you travel and what you do nowadays and how you do seminars and yep. uh, you have your own association. Yeah, we got a, 150 academies in association. And uh, when I started the association it was uh, late 92. Uh, I started the first Jiu-Jitsu Association because I was teaching a guy from Virginia Beach. Okay. His name was Frank Cucci. I and I was him. teaching over there in, in Virginia Beach uh, every month. He's a Navy SEAL, I think. Navy SEAL, yep. yeah. That's how he got Frank, me in the, yeah. uh, this is Frank, a great guy. And that's how he got me in, a, in the military Navy SEAL was through Frank. And I did a lot of demos. We put a program together for the SEALs. And the, the program is still there even today. Yep. Uh, we have a black belt that teach at the base, you know, incredible guys out from Virginia Beach from Frank's school. And, um, you know, it was in the beginning, it was pretty hard. Uh, I started my association in 92 because Frank. And after that, I met Greg Nelson. I met uh, Jeff Curran. I started meeting other guys and, and the association started growing. When I had about 30 academies uh, associated, Hickson Gracie, he decided to start his own association. Okay. And that's the JJG? No, that's way before. Okay. That's in the 90s. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, all right. That's in the 90s. That was like <laughs> in 95. So at 95, 96, I already have 30 schools. And when Hickson Grace started his association, not federation, but association, sure. 
I went to the whole entire Pedro Sauer Association, 30 schools, and I told everybody, I said, guys, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to be associated with Hickson Gracie. And that's my instructor, uh -huh. and I owe uh, loyalty, I, sure. owe, I owe respect to this guy, sure. so the Pedro Sauer Association from now on is over. And I gave to Hickson pretty much 30 academies. And we all merged to Hickson Grace Association. And uh, we stayed there until uh, 2000. Is that right? Yeah, for about four, uh, four or five years we stayed in the, in the association. And after that we have some uh, issues that was happening in Minnesota uh, through uh, some, Greg Nelson was an incredible guy, one of my black belts at the, uh, he's not a black belt at the time. He was, uh, he was, that was early, around 2000. So anyway, Greg Nelson, another guy who was, uh, associated to and the guy didn't like Greg anyway we started these little things sure and they tried to get to Greg to be uh, to be out the association to put him out of the association huh and as I didn't agree with that they sure. said no the Greg Nelson is an outstanding guy you cannot you will not do that because this is not a, this is not right and Greg is an outstanding guy and if somebody doesn't like what Greg's doing you really got to investigate sure you know because Greg's just a top-notch class Unbelievable martial arts protection, and it's still still with me in, in today. He's one of the highest ranking association, and and the guy is just incredible. So that's the reason that uh, I I was kind of stepped out of the association with Hickson, uh, with the Hickson Grace Association, sure. and after that, uh, you know, God kind of took uh, Hoxon, you know, kind of decided to call him too early, and uh, we lost Hoxon. Okay. And uh, when we lost Hoxon, it was so hard for everybody else, you know, Hickson and Kim, the whole. You know, the family was, was very, uh, it was very harsh for everybody. So what happened at the Hickson and Kim, they didn't want to deal too much with the association because it's a headache, oh, without sure. a doubt. And what happened that after 2001, I started Pedro's Association again. Okay. And, uh, you know, today we have, uh, you know, 19 years later, we've got 150 academies. We form over, over 150 black belts. That's incredible. And every single one, top-notch guys. Every single one is just good people. You breed quality. Yes, sir. And I appreciate that, and I've recognized that. I get a lot of guys, I get a lot of your black belts out there, not only listening and watching this, but they comment. And, you know, they, they've been instrumental in being supportive of what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. And I can appreciate that. I really yep. can. It's, yep. it's a beautiful thing. Yep, yep. And you know, you know, Professor, let me ask you something. Do you have... I always ask this question. I ask this to Hoyler. Do you have an actual story, short story for us about Grandmaster Elio and you being in the family down there, out there training jiu-jitsu six hours a day in Brazil? Well, with Grandmaster Elio, I have a lot of stories. I got a lot of time. You know, I, he was my instructor, you know, for many years. I got a chance to see Elio uh, when I was 15 years old, you know, and I moved to America. I was 32, uh -huh. and I moved here with him. We basically yeah. sleep together in the garage. And Elio always liked me as a, as a uh, he always picked me for do, like every time he showed a technique to the, to the class, he, I was called, Pedrinho, come here. And I was a small guy, I was gentle, I was very relaxed. So Elio likes to show moves against me. Sure. And at the same time, he likes the way I was training. Number one, Elio was a good friend of my mom. Okay. He ended up meeting my mom. And by the way, they die on the same day. Believe it or not. Is that right? Elio and my mom died in the same day, same year, just four hours apart. Yeah. They passed away in the same day. So that was kind of another big shock for me. But uh, because my mom and Elio was friends, I believe my mom probably told Elio the way I was. You know, I was a troublemaker. I got kicked out from 12 schools when I was a kid. I was a troublemaker, very hyper. And Elio, mm, yeah, so <laughs> my mom used to say, hey, Elio, Pedro's uh -oh. kind of crazy. And Elio's like, hmm, me, yeah, he doesn't look crazy. I don't see crazy on Pedro. Uh, you know, Elio, he is, he's crazy. He's been kicked out from 12 school. He's this, he's that, he's always hyper. He took medicine. He's been doing treatments for all these years. All those electrical shocks, all this stuff. He done it all. <laughs> Elio's like, me, I still don't buy that. <laughs> and Elio told, ask my mom, say, me, if I give Pedro a $100 bill and tell him to eat it, you think he'll eat it or he put it in his pocket? And my mom kind of kind of awkward said, oh, well, I'm pretty sure he's gonna put it in his pocket. Say, Miriam, he's not that crazy. Ah. So that's what he did with me. He kind of got me one time on the mat. I was I remember I was in downtown. Sure. Downtown Rio de Janeiro. So I was a little kid. Right. 16 years old, probably, young kid. Yeah. And when I was in downtown, 
Elio got in a mount position. He was oh. kind of do a little sparring. Uh -huh. He got in a mount position and I tried to escape. And I push here, push there. Elbow escape here, elbow escape there. Push, elbow escape. Try, 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 try. Could, could not escape. <laughs> and Elio put a hand on my neck. One hand on my neck. And pretty soon he told me, so, so, you think you're crazy? Oh, no. When he said that, like my eyes kind of make eye contact with Elio. like, what? Hey, you can trick your parents, oh, son of a gun, but you don't treat me. Right, right. He's calling your bluff. He called my bluff there. And you know what happened? That was the first time in my life that somebody called my bluff. And got your attention. And got my attention. The problem that I got terrified because I'm like, my goodness, this guy didn't believe what I'm saying here. How many other people does not believe in that? Sure. How many other? Because I thought I could trick everybody. I right. thought I was crazy. Sure. I believed that I was crazy. I get that. So Elio kind of, kind of reversed that. And after that, I, I, I think my personality got built back again, but with more respectful. Sure. Because before I was, I was a good. I was being, uh, I had a good manners because I had a good parents. But I was wild, I was very agitated. And what happened now, I have to put everything in perspective. So I just calm down, I end up to be more calm, more relaxed. I never been a fighter, I never been aggressive. I always been the more technical side. Sure. You know, that's, that's always been my style. I've never been like a, a competitor that can win tournaments. I, I compete in every belt from white to black. I compete in every belt, in every tournament, and most of the time, we, me and Hoyler end up on the, on the finals. Is that right? And Hoyler won every time, yep. <laughs> you know, that's the thing with Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. It changes and transforms <coughs> people and changes lives. Yep. And it's an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. And it changes kids' behavior. Oh, yeah. Completely. I've yeah. seen it yep. myself, so I've witnessed it myself. You know, this is interesting. So, Professor Sauer. <coughs> What is in the future for you? What is the future of Master Professor Sauer? Well, now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still devoted to, to the association because I'm devoted to Grandmaster Elio. I cannot let what been passed to me, I cannot let this die. No. And, and today I think I, I see a lot of people complain about, you know, lack of self-defense or too much competition and treason. I see a lot of, a lot of things, but the bottom line that I don't see too much emphasis on the strategy, mm of Grandmaster Elio Grace basic principles. That was the survival principle. You have to survive. Yeah. You have to, to, to protect yourself. You have to be, to buy time. Because if you are fighting against somebody and you're smaller and you have another guy bigger, you will be in a bad spot. Independent of who you are, you're gonna be in, a, in the bottom. Sure. And when you know how to survive, you just buy time, and eventually you can make the guy say uncle. That's why Hoist fought to no time limit. Sure. Right? Because, hey, I'm giving up 50 pounds here, 100 pounds, so no time limit. Yeah, he's going to catch him either way. So you gotta, you got to let me work until I get to the, this. You know, I'm not going to be able to snap any submission no. uh, in a second. Could have happened, but that's not the odds. Right. The odds will be more like, you know, a bigger guy has to be there until he gets a little bit tired or until you kind of start g get inside the muscle memory. You start to attack the guy a little bit to see how he defend the first time. You attack again, see how he defend again. Oh, he defend now twice the same thing. The third time you snap a move. Uh -huh. So that's what we need. And that's how Elio. You start learning your opponent's uh, habits and uh, ticks. Exactly. All his, tells. all his muscle memories. We right. get the muscle memory. And after that, you can go ahead and auto Jiu Jitsu. And that's precisely Elio Grace Jiu Jitsu. Sure. So when you talk about self-defense, it's more like a self-protection. Right. We protect ourselves because you can start, imagine, I can start to look for things uh, if we're in the street and I feel myself threatened by you mm -hmm. and I see that you, you, know, you kind of got in a stand that I can see your right hand back so I can smell that the right hand could be the, your, your punch that's going to come. Sure. You know, in, in Jiu Jitsu, if you understand self-defense, I can slow motion imagine yourself getting base. I can slow motion predict yourself closing your fist. I can slow motion, can start imagine you swinging the right arm. So what you do, I walk to the other side where you don't have base, where you have to protect, where you have to ch change your base, where you have to use your weak arm. This is called self-defense. Yeah. It's a self-protection. Okay. The in jiu-jitsu, when you understand jiu-jitsu, give us the ability to read people before they do anything. We know probabilities. Sure. And that's how we learn when you play jiu-jitsu with self-defense. When you play jiu-jitsu with sport, you only put the money what's going to give you a, an award. That's the big differences right there. Survival versus, you know, sport and, you know, just doing it for... 
bragging the, rights. Well, you're doing for the points. Sure. I need to score the points. So it doesn't matter how much it's going to cost me. I put my hand right between your legs because I got to go for the sweep. And, and nothing wrong with that. This is a beautiful mechanic to do in jiu-jitsu and in sport, and I advise everybody to do it. Uh -huh. But make sure that you do your homework as a self-defense if you want to build longevity. Because without the self-defense, you cannot have longevity. Sure. Because we cannot fight for moves after the moves being done towards us, especially after getting older. Mm. When you get older mm. and you fight for moves that's not there, that's, it's like, you know, come on, man. You guys put in a triangle and you're going to try to escape now. The guy's got a triangle perfect locked. Come on, man. The guy had your arm straight like a bow. You want to try to escape now? You know, the guy has two hands in the neck, squeezing. You want to try to escape now? So that's what is important for us to understand the self-defense aspect. It's the same thing. Imagine a boxer trying to defend punches after the punch got connected in the jaw. Yeah. It's I, the same I, thing. I, I, it's not giving your opponent opportunities. And but knowing what their next move could or should be. Yep. And that's the most incredible chess, that's the human chess game, because what starts to play in two, three, four, five moves ahead. And when you transfer this, and that's my personal opinion, my personal hint here, when we transfer this to a social environment, so now you're in a social environment, and you're arguing with something, you can be with your wife, can be with your boss, can be with somebody else in, this, in the street, you know, no longer attach to the present. We attach for the next move. Hey, if I say this, the guy can say this and this and this. If I say that, he can. I start playing with probabilities. Right. Because over here, my mind, my, my mind is no longer stuck on the present. It's stuck on the future. Right. So the same thing that, I, that my mind should be over here on the mat, when we grapple, when we train jiu-jitsu, you should be thinking about the future. You should not be thinking about the guys getting your neck. It's right too late. He got your hand on the neck already. Right? Yeah, I get it. It's 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 chess on the mats. It's chess in real life if you're surviving. Yep. And it's knowing three or four moves ahead of time. Yep. Because you have that muscle memory and you have been there before. Exactly. It's incredible stuff. Yep. It really is. Yep. Well, Professor Master Sauer, I appreciate you sitting down and sharing with the the audience out there and people who are going to watch this we really appreciate you coming to kansas city sitting down with this spending some time with this <laughs> and promoting one of our hermanos carlos carlos, carlos vargas carlos vargas yes great guy he's been a love carlos. Remember carlos when he was a little kid for you know he's been around for 14 years so yeah. one of the greatest guy and it's always a pleasure uh anytime that i see jiu-jitsu anything that i can do to help people to understand jiu-jitsu in a better way in more uh, using more uh, like you know more like a good manners uh, more integrity more discipline more respect anytime you can bring these values to jiu-jitsu i'm all about there because uh, jiu-jitsu is true uh, the, the 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 art of jiu-jitsu is too priceless sure. it's not just a fighting no jiu-jitsu is, is a lifestyle absolutely and we can really be a better human beings when you start to understand that i agree and it's, a, it's an amazing thing. It transforms lives, and it gives you purpose in your life. Yep. It gives you structure and discipline. Yep. And that's so important if you're going to be successful. The, the last thing, you told me what I'm going to be doing. So one thing that I do quite often lately, I, I do camps in Brazil. That is a pretty kind of cool uh, thought. It's um, two times a year, we have camps in Brazil that I take people there for 10 days. Oh. Yep, and we visit the Grace, Grace of Maitala. Okay. I go, we go there to Hoker all the time. We have a school that I helped to, to start. I'm one of the founders of the school in Petropolis. That's right by Elio Grace's house. Okay. Grace in Petropolis. Uh, one of the representatives, his name is Breno Angelo. He's uh, one yeah, of the yeah, guys yeah, that yeah. I took. I, I, I correspond with him on uh, Instagram a lot. Breno Angelo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Breno Angelo. I took him to the Grace Academy when he was a purple belt. Is that right? Yep. And I helped him to get up to a black belt. Great guy. So anybody who ever thought about going to Brazil, we have a beautiful spot in Brazil. All the Grand Master Elio Grace belongs. His car, his bed, uh, his stable, tons of things. Uh, the washing machine from the Grace Academy. We have all this in our own bed and breakfast over there in Brazil. And that's what we socialize there around that, eat, sleep, and drive around the Petropolis. Gonna have to go check that out. Cause I'm, uh, my, look, I might even stay there. Cause look, I have to go down and get my knee replaced in Brazil anyway. Okay. Because I injured it doing Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like something I should do anyway, yep. you know? So if you're out there, check him out, 
check what is what is it called again? Uh, it's, it's in Petropolis. In Petropolis. Petropolis is the town name name of the town, and we have a bed and breakfast. That used to be my grandfather's home, summer home, and it's a paradise. We have a waterfall in the backyard. Oh. It's just a paradise. Pool. It's just unbelievable. You see birds, monkeys. You see all kind of animals there. Gorgeous. The temperature is perfect. The oxygen is perfect. It's just a paradise. Get a hold of this association if you want to visit that uh, bed and breakfast. I would highly suggest it because I'm look, I'm going to be going down there and checking that out myself. You're going to like it, Professor. Thank you so much for sitting down and uh, hanging out with us and just you know sharing with everybody out there and uh well i think that's going to be it and i think that's all we got today and so hey i appreciate you guys out there watching listening please comment like subscribe and share because we need you guys to share we need our brazilian and gracie jiu-jitsu brothers out there to share this okay because the man himself is sitting next to me and Thanks, he man. wants his story shared anyway hey my name is jameson sharp and this is Pedro Sauer. And you're listening and watching the Jiu Jitsu Takedown podcast. Appreciate you having me here. Thank you, brother. And well, see you guys later. Take care. Be safe, Have guys. a good one. Thank you.